Turn with me to Psalm 118. Now, I'll have you stand. Let's get the blood flowing a little bit. Have you stand and uh, we're going to read this scripture together. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let Israel say his faithful love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his faithful love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his faithful love endures forever. I called to the Lord in distress and the Lord answered me and put me in a spacious place. The Lord is for me. I will not be afraid. What can a mere mortal do to me? The Lord is my helper. Therefore, I will look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humanity. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in nobles. All the nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I destroyed them. Yes, they surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I destroyed them. They surrounded me like bees. They were extinguished like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I destroyed them. They pushed me hard to make me fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my soul. He has become my salvation. There are shouts of joy and victory in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand performs valiantly. The Lord's right hand is raised. The Lord's right hand performs valiantly. I will not die, but I will live and proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord disciplined me severely, but did not give me over to death. Open the gates of righteousness for me, and I will enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the Lord's gate. The righteous will enter through it. I will give thanks to you because you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came from the Lord, and it is wondrous in our sight. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, save us. Lord, please grant us success. He who comes in the name of the Lord is blessed. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God and has given us light. Bind the festival cords, uh, festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will give you thanks. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. You can be seated. One of the amazing things about Jesus is that his love endures forever. His grace endures forever. His faithfulness endures forever. When you put your trust in Jesus Christ, the effects of that go on for eternity. Um, I, I was an 11 year old boy when I came to faith in Jesus Christ. And can I tell you something? He has never ceased to be my Lord. And he'll be my Lord someday when I, you'll hear that I've died. Someday I'll be, as Adrian Rogers said, kicking up gold dust in glory. <laughs> because my salvation is eternal. My God is forever faithful. And Jesus has made a way for me. And I'm so grateful for that. Uh, we need to understand what God has done for us and to praise him for that. Uh, we need his work and his activity in our lives. And uh, the greatest work that Jesus can do for an individual is to help them come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Um, the scripture was actually written and uh, long before Jesus came, but uh, was used in the Passover celebration. Uh, the Passover, which uh, Jesus celebrated his, with his disciples, became the Lord's Supper under the New Covenant because we remember what Jesus has done. The Passover looks forward to what Jesus would do. And so uh, this scripture is the scripture quoted on Palm Sunday when Jesus came through the gates of Jerusalem to enter into the city of Jerusalem. Uh, the crowds were yelling, Hosanna, which means save, please. 
Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This was a psalm that was considered to be a psalm about the coming Messiah. This latter part of this chapter was about the Messiah. He would be the one who would come. He would be the stone the builders rejected who would become the cornerstone. Jesus would be the one who would open the gates of righteousness. All of this was his work. But the psalm also looks forward to the faithfulness of God in other ways and looks back to the faithfulness of God. If you've been a Christian very long, you can think of times when God has been faithful, when God has answered prayer, when God has brought you through a difficult time. He is still the same faithful God. He doesn't change. And he can bring you through again. And we need to put our trust in him because he is indescribably great indescribably faithful. We could just give some basic things about his faithfulness that can't truly plumb the depths of it. Uh, the title of my message is The Greatness of Our God because his faithfulness to us is one of the main characteristics of his greatness. And, um, and we're going to talk, in what ways was, was, uh, is our God great? He is great because he is eternally Faithful. He is eternally faithful. Now, they're, they're singing this song and they're praising God. They say, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his faithful love, his hesed, endures forever. He gets excited. I think he's kind of getting happy in Jesus. So he's going around the room. He said, let Israel say He's been faithful. Let the house of Aaron say, he's been faithful. Let those who fear God say, he's been faithful forever. <laughs> he is still the same God. He is eternally faithful. God cannot fail. Uh, he gives some examples. He says, I called the Lord and it distressed him. The Lord answered me. He's faithful to answer prayer, isn't he? He says, I, I've seen his faithfulness. I don't have to be afraid. What can other mortal men do to me because my God is faithful? It has to go through his permission in order for anything else to come to my life. The Lord is my helper. He's eternally faithful to help us. He says, I've learned it's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in me to trust in others. A lot of people trust in a lot of different things. Uh, some people trust the government. Uh, if you do, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, some people trust uh, science. And, uh, you know, it's funny. Scientists are always finding reasons to disagree with the previous scientists, right? Um, it, you know, their, their views are changing and they're constantly... Uh, looking at things from different angles, but others trust in education. <coughs> education is a great thing, but education is limited. You and I are limited. Uh, guess what? If you get educated by somebody who's wrong, you're going to be wrong, right? And that, that so education is only as good as the person who provides it. Um, but our God is always eternally faithful, always reliable. He has perfect knowledge, perfect power, and a perfect love for us that is demonstrated in the cross. He is always going to be faithful. Now, sometimes that faithfulness will be in the ways we don't like, right? Uh, my, my parents, especially my dad, uh, was faithful to warm up my backside and to teach me how to live and to be respectful and to do the right thing. And I'm grateful to him for it. Uh, I'm, I'm glad he didn't just let me go my own way. God does that. Sometimes he's faithful to discipline us when we go astray. The Bible says those who, who the Lord loves, he disciplines. Um, God is also faithful to train us in righteousness. And sometimes that will be uh, easier and sometimes that will be harder but he takes us through the process of training us to help us become the people that we need to be he's faithful to do that and sometimes it's uncomfortable sometimes we get out of our comfort zone 
but God is faithful. Uh, where God guides, he provides. You've heard that before. Uh, but whenever God leads you to go through a door, God will supply what you need to go through that door. Uh, whenever God gives you something to do or gives you a path to try, it may be a hard path, but he'll give you the grace to walk. He is faithful. Sometimes he's faithful to sustain us through. Other times he's faithful to deliver us from. And because he has all knowledge and all wisdom, he knows exactly which of those things to do. Did you know you don't need to deliver your kid from every bit of problems that they have? They've got to learn how to handle problems on their own because why? they're going to leave your house someday, right? They've got to be equipped to handle problems on their own. And so you, you train them, you, you try to teach them well on how to deal with problems, but ultimately they've got to learn how to do that. So God also trains us and he equips us so that we can fulfill the purposes he's given us to fulfill. So he is eternally faithful. I love that scripture uh, says, I, I'm young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging for bread. Can I tell you something? God's faithful. <laughs> I, my, my church secretary in, in Texas um, was an older lady and she had been a single mom. She raised her, raised her son on her own and uh, she said there'd be times where, where she would uh, be wondering how they were going to make it through. And uh, she would sit down on her, her couch and she'd begin to tell the Lord about what needs she had. And, and she, she said, did you know we never went hungry? We always had what we needed. God always supplied. Listen, I want to tell you something. God is faithful. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we get our eyes on the... Listen, I want to tell you something. It doesn't matter which way our country goes. God still be faithful. Did you know that? Uh, it doesn't matter how wicked people get. God will still be faithful. He is faithful. So, uh, the greatness of our God. In what ways is He great? He's great because He's eternally faithful. Secondly, He's great because He does mighty things. He does mighty things. Things. Look at verse 15. The Lord's right hand performs valiantly. The Lord, verse 14, the Lord is my strength and my song. Look at verse 16. The Lord's right hand is raised. The Lord's right hand performs valiantly. He does mighty things. I dare say there's no one in this room who has split the Red Sea in two. <laughs> Did you know God can make axe heads float? God can bring people back to life from the dead. God can heal the sick. Uh, God can do it long distance. Did you know that? Uh, Naaman uh, was a forger. He came to Israel and uh, to visit the prophet. And the prophet didn't even come out to meet him. He sent his servant at him. Uh, and he said, go dip in the Jordan seven times. And it's... Uh, he goes and he dips in the sun. The prophet doesn't come with him. Why? Because God can heal long distance. Uh, he has mighty power. Uh, he, can, he can speak. Jesus, when he was walking this earth as God the Son, he spoke to the winds and the waves. And they instantly became a calm. And the disciples' mouths were falling open and saying, what kind of man is this who speaks to the winds and the waves and everything? Our God's presence can make the ground shake. He speaks and the sound of his voice is like many waters. He is awesome in power. The Israelites, as they fought battles, uh, I, I think of Gideon. You have this host of Midianites who have come against the people of Israel who are oppressing them. And God goes to Gideon. He's hiding in a wine press. And God says, I want you to uh, be a leader for my people. And he says, me? And uh, yes, uh, you know. And uh, God appoints him. And he tells him, he gives him a battle plan. He tells him, I want you to take a torch, a clay pot, 
and a trumpet with you, and I want you to have everybody else do the same thing. When I uh, tell you, you're going to shout, you're going to blow the trumpet, you're going to smash the, the pottery and hold the torch high, and I'll give you the victory. That was the whole battle plan. So Gideon goes out and they do that and, and the Midianites are, are woken up in the, from their sleep and they see torches all around them and they get confused and they, by, by God's design, and they begin to kill each other and Israel wins a great victory and they don't have to kill anybody. They, the Midianites kill themselves. Now that's what I call a battle right there. Why? Because God is powerful and God is wise. And he has all power. He does mighty things. Sometimes we forget that. Did you know you can never ask God for something that will tax him? Now, he may know not to give it to you. He may know it's a better, it's a better idea if you don't have it. And, and you know, I, I uh, am grateful to my parents. They didn't always give me what I wanted, right? I, I'd have probably been in trouble. I, I, you know, kids... Hey, you know, uh, I want a sword. Give me a samurai sword, you know. Cut off the head of my brother, you know. And uh, uh, no kid needs a samurai sword, right? But, but I would have been happy to have a samurai sword as a little boy. I thought those things were cool. Parents know what to give their kids, what not to give their kids. But, but we need to remember that God is all powerful. We need to ask big, bold prayers. Of God because he is an awesome God. He is a great God. Um, if you go and you look at, at, at the prayers offered in the Bible, and I, I think of Hannah and offering these prayers to God, and she was unable to have children, and she just began to cry out to God. She was so burdened. She began to weep in the temple, praying and agonizing in prayer to God. Lord, please give me a a son, and, and uh, God answered her prayer. Gave her a son, not just any son. She gave God gave her a son that would be a prophet that would turn the tide and change things in Israel because she called on his name. Um, Elijah, we've been talking about Elijah on Wednesday nights, and Elijah prayed, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. As a judgment from God. And then he prayed and the rain came. That's pretty impressive too. Isn't it? Did you know that God controls the weather? Um, so pray bold prayers. Uh, God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. I, I remember when I was a teenager. Uh, we had one car. And uh, my mom had gotten a job, and her job was on the other side of, of Knoxville from, from where we were. And so dad was having to take her across town to drop her off for her job every day. It was inconvenient and hard and everything. We got together, and dad said, we need to pray, and we need to ask God for a car. So we, I, re I remember it clear, just like it was yesterday. We got, we got down together, got the circle, got down together, we prayed. God said, I remember my dad was, was praying. He said, uh, Lord, you know we can't afford to buy another car, but we need one. Would you supply it? It wasn't a long prayer, just kind of a brief prayer, but we prayed for that. Uh, that next Sunday night, uh, a man in our church was a used car salesman, and he called my dad. And he said, uh, yeah, I think he owned a lot. He said, uh, I've never done this in, in my life. He said, but I feel like God wants me to give you a car. He said, so what I want you to do, bring a dollar bill, and uh, we'll make the transaction legal, okay? But I'm going to give you this car. And he gets that. You know, that's probably the only car we had out going up that worked right. <laughs> but uh, we, listen, God blessed us. Why? Because we just had the boldness to ask for it. Try them out. Jeremiah said this, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. What great and mighty things do you need? Some things that you don't even know about. Every, have you ever thought about praying for what you don't know you need? <laughs> 
He said, I'll give you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. This is the God we serve. He knows what we need even when we don't know it. So ask him. All right. So the greatness of our God, in what ways is he great? He's great because he's eternally faithful. He's great because he does mighty things. He's great because he delivers from death. I love this. Verse 17, 18. By the way, this is a chapter of scripture that was very precious to many of those who were persecuted uh, in the areas of the world where the persecuted churches suffer. Verse 17. I will not die, but I will live. And proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord disciplined me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Did you know that God's in charge of when you live and when you die? Man's not in charge. God's in charge. I've sat in hospital rooms and heard the doctors say, your, your loved one doesn't have a week to live. And then been visiting that loved one at their home several years later. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. Doctors are not the final word. God is the final word. Amen. I will not die, but I will live and declare the work of the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> God delivers from death. And, and this, he delivers from spiritual death. If you don't know Jesus Christ today, the Bible says that you're spiritually dead. Uh, it's not that you're kind of good and that God will reform you. According to the scripture, you're spiritually dead. You need a spiritual resurrection. And only God can do that for you. And so uh, we, what we do is we come to God and we, we repent of our sin. We put our trust in Jesus Christ. And he makes us a new creation in Christ. He brings us to life spiritually. The Bible calls it being born again. So that we have spiritual life in our soul. Listen, I'm going to tell you, if you're a child of God today... It's not because of you. It's not because God says, oh, man, I'm really impressed with that one. I think I'll give that one eternal life. No, no, it had nothing to do with that. God's gracious and he's good. And he said, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And when you called upon his name, in his grace, not because you deserved it, but in spite of the fact you didn't deserve it, he brought life to your soul and made you new. Now, I'm telling you, if you don't know Jesus today, he'll do the same for you. He's not a respecter of persons. You call on his name in faith and repentance. He will save your soul. He also resurrects emotionally. Uh, one of the songs says, You lifted my life out of the pit and crowned me with love and compassion. Have you ever felt like your life was in the pit emotionally? Have you ever been struggling just to make it through the day? Have you ever wondered how I'm going to get out of this pattern in my life and you've, been, you've just been struggling and you're at your end emotionally? Can I tell you, Jesus can lift you up. He's the one who delivers from death. He delivers from death emotionally. He brings us out of the pit. He put a new song in my heart. Uh, Psalm 103 talks about he renews your youth like the evil. He gives you a fresh start, a new excitement about life. God can do that. That's who he is. He delivers from death. And I want to tell you something. We, Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. He's not the only person in the Bible who was raised from the dead. There were several of those. But those were all raised from the dead to die again. Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection because he was raised from the dead never to die again. He was given a glorified body and he lives forevermore. And one day, you and I are going to be in the same boat. <laughs> we don't know when it is. It could be today. God could say, son, go get your bride. And it could happen today. Uh, in one instant, the dead in Christ will rise. In one instant, those who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord of the air. They'll be transformed. We'll be given a glorified body to live forevermore. That's who our God is. He delivers from death. So, He's great. 
supremely great, because he is eternally faithful, because he does mighty things, because he delivers from death, and because he makes a way. He makes a way. Look at verse 19. Open the gates of righteousness for me, and I will enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. Now, you, you, you may say, well, this is a, a psalm. It's, a, it's poetry, and he's speaking figuratively. Well, that, you, you could take it that way. But listen, I want to tell you something. Jesus fulfilled this literally in history. And the Jews, when Jesus came in to the gate at Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, they weren't thinking about figuratively fulfilling this, this passage. They were thinking of a very literal fulfillment. Hosanna! Hosanna! Lord, save! The Bible says in Matthew that the whole city was shaken. That's how impacted they were by what was happening when Jesus walked through the gates of Jerusalem. Now, they may have had other ideas of how Jesus was going to be a Messiah. They may have gotten the second coming. You know, we, we found out the second coming is part of the picture and the equation where Jesus will rule and reign forevermore. Um, but Jesus did come to save. He just came to save the cross, as Isaiah 53 predicted. So, open the gates of righteousness. He says, he says, Lord, you've disciplined me, verse 18. You've disciplined me severely, but did not give me over to death. In other words, he's had sin in his life. God's disciplined him for it, but was merciful to him. And he says, open the gates of righteousness. In other words, I can't do this. I need your help to open the gates of righteousness for me. Did you know Jesus is the only one who can open the gates of righteousness for anybody? You can't be righteous enough in your own strength. The Bible says our righteousness is just filthy rags. But, but Jesus makes a way. <clears throat> Elsewhere he says, I, he, look at verse uh, 21. I will give thanks to you because you have answered me, opening that gate of righteousness, and have become my salvation. He didn't say you, you have given me salvation. He says you have become my salvation. How's that so? Only Jesus has become salvation through his death at the cross and his mighty resurrection. Uh, he is our Savior. Others may give the message of salvation like I'm doing today. Others may set an example of being saved, but only Jesus can be your salvation. <laughs> Did you know it takes somebody mightier than you or me to save a soul? Uh, there's another scripture that says, uh, uh, you know, what is the ransom of man's life? How can, how, how can someone atone for another man's soul? It's, it's impossible. Listen, only God can do it. And God the Son became a man and went to a cross to become our salvation. He made a way. Aren't you glad? Amen. Jesus is described further. It, 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 how did he become our salvation? Verse 22 tells us the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Now, at the end of this chapter, Israel is calling out for this Messiah to save them. So it's obvious they can't save themselves. Some have taken this cornerstone verse to be talking about Israel. Can't be talking about Israel. Israel can't save Israel from Israel's own sin. Right? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, how can somebody who's in the pit bring themselves out of the pit if they don't have the power to do it? Okay? So, Jesus has become the cornerstone. He is the stone the builders rejected. Who were the builders? The leadership of Israel, the, the Jesus day. They rejected Jesus. You, all you have to do is read the Gospels and you find that every time Jesus, almost every place he goes, that they're following him, opposing him, trying to trap him, asking him questions to get him in trouble, uh, plotting his death. You read the book of John, even from the beginning of the book of John, it says they were plotting his death. 
They rejected Jesus. They hated Jesus. And they ultimately brought him over to the Romans to get him nailed to a cross. But the stone the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. <laughs> Jesus died, he was buried, and he supernaturally rose from the dead. And he sits now at the right hand of the Father. He's the head of the corner. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. All the angelic host bows before him. And one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he's Lord. He's the head of the corner. <laughs> There's no one like him. There's no one who even comes close. How did Jesus make a way? He was the stone the builders rejected. Listen, I, you want to know greatness? Greatness is not just having power. Greatness is somebody who uses their power for good. Jesus used his power. He left the throne of glory to become a man. To clothe himself with our flesh. To live our life. To experience the grief, the toil, the heartache of this world just like we experience it. Tempted in every way just as we are yet without sin. And he went to a cross to take the wrath for sin that I deserve, that you deserve. The, the justice of God had to be satisfied. Jesus, as the infinite Son of God, satisfied the wrath of a holy God in a moment of time as only God the Son could do. And he said, it is finished. The price is paid. As Jesus yells out, it is finished. The Gospel of Matthew tells us, the temple veil was ripped in two from top to bottom. Now that was an impressive feat. It was a supernatural one. <laughs> uh, I'm told that multiple teams of horses couldn't have pulled the, uh, it, took, it would take I think six teams of horses to pull that veil apart. That's how thick it was. God ripped it from top to bottom so nobody else could get the credit for it. He was showing something that was very significant the way it had been made. Open to me the gates of righteousness. How can a sinful man commune with a holy God? How can there be a way when there are nothing but barriers? Did you know that's what the temple and the, the tabernacle were designed to show? There was a veil before the courtyard. If you're not uh, uh, a Jewish male... You could not enter beyond that veil. There was another veil at the entrance of the tabernacle. If you were not a priest, you could not enter behind that veil. There was another veil before the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest could enter only once a year with the blood of a sacrifice. And at great personal risk of, of death, they would tie a rope around his ankle in case God struck him dead in the Holy of Holies. God was fearful. He was terrified. Because sinful men and holy gods don't get along well together. God's holiness is dangerous. Nadab and Abihu were struck dead. The, the fire came out of the tabernacle and burned them. And, and there was nothing left but the censers that they had used to disobey God. Listen, our God is a holy God. That's why the cross was necessary. It wasn't just for us, it was for God. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Listen, God, did, God loves us. He doesn't want to send us to hell. Did you know nobody goes to hell because God wants them to go there? God has made a way. He sent Jesus. And Jesus willingly became the propitiation, the wrath bearer for our sin. Jesus willingly justify that is to declare innocent how could he do that because he was declared guilty his sin was placed or our I'm sorry our sin was placed on him he had no sin our sin was placed on him and the Bible says that when God's judgment was poured out at the cross for the first time in history the fellowship of the father and the son was broken and the Father turned his back in disgust as my sin and your sin was put upon Jesus. And the 
holy justice of God was satisfied. It is finished. Open the gates of righteousness for me that I may enter. How could I enter? Only through Jesus. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Only through Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Only through Jesus Christ can we enter the gates of righteousness. Amen. But when we enter, how blessed it is. When we enter, did you know righteousness? The world tries to paint righteousness as something dull and drab and joyless and something you want to have nothing to do with. But did you know righteousness really is life as God designed us to live it? It's, it's joyful life. What did Jesus say? I came that they might have life and have it to the full. Life the best way you could have it. Listen, the problem and the reason there's so much pain and dissatisfaction and grief in this life is not uh, because of God. It's because of man. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and the curse came uh, because of sin. And nothing was the same. But Jesus came to set a reverse on that. To change it back. So that we could have the perfect state. Now we're not in it now. Just We're not in it. We live between two ages right now as Christians. We're in this present evil age. But we're also a member of the age to come. Through, through Christ. But one day when Jesus comes. The age to come is going to come in all its fullness. And you and I won't struggle with sin. We'll have perfect lives. And we will enter the most perfect joy. The most perfect peace. Uh, the greatest experiences. Because there will be nothing to dull the experience. There will be no sickness. There will be no pain. There will be no heartache. There will be no grief. There will be no struggle. Because Jesus will have taken away the curse. I love those words in Revelation. And there was no longer any curse. Why? Because cursed is the one who hangs on a tree. And Jesus hung on a tree for me. Open the gates of righteousness for me that I may enter. Listen, I want to tell you something. Jesus is the gate not just to your salvation to keep you from hell. Jesus is the gate to every good thing that you could possibly have from God. And the best is yet to come. We've not seen anything yet. So... He says, verse 23, this came from the Lord. It's wonderful. It is awesome in our sight. This is the day the Lord has made. In other words, this day is going to happen this Friday. As we commemorate Good Friday, this day, this is the day the Lord has made for me and for you. Let's rejoice in it. Let's be glad because God has made a way. Then they begin to pray in, uh, Lord, save us. Uh, the Hebrew there is Hoshiana, uh, which is where we get the Greek word Hosanna. Um, Lord, save us. Please grant us success. Uh, he who comes in the name of the Lord. Who is this? He who comes in the name of the Lord. Who is this? It's the Messiah. It's the same one that the Jews have been expecting since God told Eve. That the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. It's the same one that was expected when God told Abraham, Through your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. It's the same one when God told David, One of your descendants, one of your seed is going to sit on the throne and rule forever. It's him. It's the same one that God would later tell Isaiah uh, would be a suffering servant and would ultimately come. Uh, to redeem humanity. This is the one. The expectation of all the Old Testament. The expectation of all salvation history. He who comes in the name of the Lord. Is blessed. So as Jesus walked through the gates. Of Jerusalem. Even though they misunderstood in some ways. How he was the Messiah. It was an incredibly significant day. 
because as he walked in, he, 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 he was on the donkey, riding on the donkey, fulfilling Zechariah 9, um, the Messiah had come. The one they had been waiting for their whole lives, the one they'd heard about and they'd been taught about. And for generations of heartache and struggle, and he'd come. He'd come. And it's worthy of celebration. <laughs> the Lord God, verse 27, has given us light. Bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. Now, this is kind of in, an interesting scripture. Um, how would the gates of righteousness be open? They would be open to the one who was the stone the builders rejected, but uh, they had this whole sacrificial history as well. Did you know Jesus at the cross is the fulfillment of all the sacrifices in Israel? Now, we don't have time to get into how he fulfills them and all of that, uh, but just in the very basic sense, this redemption, this substitutionary sacrifice was the basic idea of the sacrificial system. But he says, bind, literally in the Hebrew, it could be, the word can be translated festival, bind the festival to the horns of the altar. Uh, the burn altar of burnt offering had four horns on it. And uh, they would put the sacrifices there that they were, they were slaughtering uh, and, and it was a picture of Jesus who was yet to come. But they're saying bind, they could be translated, bind the festival to, this, to the altar. I was thinking about this and I thought, you know what? That's appropriate because Jesus is the festival. What's the festival they celebrate? The Passover. What's the Passover about? It's about Jesus. What's the ultimate fulfillment of it? Calvary. Bind the festival to the altar. You see, Jesus is the one that all these things anticipate. Um, he says, You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. How does God's faithful love come to us? Only through Jesus. The greatest expression of God's faithfulness, of his power, of his love is Jesus Christ. Open the gates of righteousness for me. I will enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. If you're a child of God here this morning, I want to encourage you to give thanks to the Lord for all these things, especially in this Easter season as we remember Jesus' sacrifice at the cross and, uh, and then his resurrection. Uh, give thanks to the Lord. Let your week this week be filled with thanksgiving if you know Jesus Christ because he, he has covered our sin. He has given us hope. <laughs> How great he is. Uh, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, there's only one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Listen, you won't find it in another religion. You won't find it in anywhere else in this world. It's only through Jesus Christ that we can be saved. So if you don't know him, you can know it. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, that is you bow the name of Jesus, Lord, I, I surrender to you. I choose to repent of my sin. I choose to turn from my sin and follow you and to, to receive your eternal life. If you're ready to do that and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One of many promises. I could, I could list a bunch of promises. God's made his promise. And one of my favorites is, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, well, you don't know my past. I don't have to. You say, well, you don't know what I've done. Uh, you don't know who I hung out with. You, you, if you knew, you would be shocked. Listen, I want to tell you something. Jesus isn't shocked. He knows. And he said, Whosoever will may come. So, the way is open. Repent. Put your trust in Jesus. If you need some help with a prayer of repentance and trust, that's your heart today. I'd be happy to help you. Or you can just come to this altar and tell the Lord in your own words how you want to follow him and receive his eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the amazing gift of your grace in Jesus Christ. Um, Lord, I pray for those who are here today that don't know Jesus, that they would receive Jesus today and his eternal life today uh, that he paid for.
with the cross. And for those of us who know him, Lord, help us be filled with gratitude and worship and adoration for all you've done for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to have a time of invitation to give you the opportunity to respond to the Lord. If you're here today as a child of God, if you uh, need prayer, you just, this altar is open. You can come to, to the altar. You can come for prayer. We want me to pray with you. Uh, if there's some sin that maybe God's putting his finger on and you need to repent of it, uh, you can come do that. Um, if God's led you in a certain direction, maybe you, to become a part of his church or, um, or perhaps... Uh, you need Jesus Christ. That's that's the greatest invitation there. Uh, you come and, and make that right today before you leave this place. You'll have a special Easter. Let's stand. Number 417. 417. <laughs>